Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us for the May uh, the, the May instantiation of the ECSS Symposium. We've got two great speakers uh, today. Our, our first speaker is Lars from TAC, who's going to talk about optimizing some code for the new Stampede system at TAC. And I think what Lars is also doing, which is going to be particularly useful, is looking at this from kind of a broader perspective, so not, not looking specifically at the science successes, which are, of course, important, but are most relevant to the principal investigator and the science group, but rather from the extended collaborative support uh, perspective, what makes these collaborations successful? Um, how do you approach, you know, collaboratively developing code, uh, you know, across distances, what are some best practices, and what, what can make these things successful. So I think that's going to be particularly useful for all of us, and also I think for campus champions in the audience who are often working with folks at their own sites in similar ways. Um, so Lars, thank you very much for putting together a thoughtful presentation for us today, and take it away. Um, questions, what I'll do is I'll open up the lines again at the end of Lars's talk for some Q&A. And if you want to get my attention during the webinar, uh, just send a, send a chat mu uh, message and I can work in a, a question into, into the, the talk with Lars also. So great. Thank you very much. Take it away, Lars. Yeah, thanks, Nancy. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for everybody attending. And I just already noticed that my two collaborators from Drake University, Klaus Bartschap and Jia Zhu Guan, are also on the phone. So I, I hope I don't butcher what what we did there or the science results too much, but luckily I didn't I didn't focus at all on the on the science. So I'm only going to report on what we actually did in this ECSS project and how we modified the code. So, um, oh, wrong button here. Um, so this ECSS project. Uh, let me introduce the team, the code, and the task at hand. So as I already mentioned, the team was uh, Klaus Bartschardt and Jia Zhu Wan from Drake University, and also two other team members, and then myself from TAC. And the code that we were interested in was, is named H2MOL, and it calculates the interaction of molecules with ultra-short laser pulses. And to do so, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation is solved uh, with the homegrown uh, code that is a pure MPI code and no threads. Uh, um, uh, were implemented when we started this, uh, this project. And the project started um, about a year ago, so before Stampede became uh, online. So the task was getting the code ready for Stampede with a special emphasis on these new Intel Xeon Phi uh, processors that we have in Stampede. Oh, wrong button again. Uh, okay, so we, we looked at the code at first and we did a general diagnosis. It was a, a pure MPI code and we, we already knew from the beginning from, from other tests that the scaling was fine up to thousands of cores because there was already some non-blocking communication uh, implemented. And I like that in particular because improving MPI scaling in a large code that is rather tedious and requires global changes. Uh, so I was, I was very pleased to, to learn at the beginning of, of the project that this was more about serial performance in some um, isolated um, uh, places in the code. Uh, the other good news was that the serial performance could be easily reproduced on one blade, so my collaborators uh, kindly set up a, an experiment for me where we used um, just one Stampede node uh, a Stampede node has 16 cores, and so we placed nine MPI tasks on that one node, and then we profiled those, those small runs. And for that, we used PerfExpert for the profiling, and we got timings out of that, and then, of course, code inspection by eye. Uh, all these profilers and also PerfExpert, they give you a wealth of, of information about missed, um, uh, missed caches or, or uh, branch predictions and stuff like that, but I actually didn't, didn't need that. So I only needed the timings to find out that 75% was used in a single routine, which was about 500 lines of code. 15% was used in a group of three routines, and then the rest was um, serial code and MPI communication. 
uh, I don't know, the code was set up that it needed to be nine. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. that, that wasn't important um, yeah. uh, at all. Okay. So, Barb, you might want to repeat, if you get questions from the group at your location, if you don't mind repeating Yeah, now. Victor just asked why nine MPI tasks, but that was just the setup of the, of the code. Uh, so that was not of any, of any relevance. It was the smallest number that the code was able to handle. Um, okay, so let's focus on region one. 75% of the compute time was spent in this one routine. And the routine had several problems. So there were many intermediate values that were calculated over and over again, and the calculation was done in nested loops. And the setup of the code was such that this all led to a high stride memory access. The code was well written in the sense that it was basically the shortest route to achieve the goal with the, with the cleanest code and the cleanest setup of the loops uh, possible. Unfortunately, we all know that that is good coding practice, but if you want to write fast code, then you have to turn it on its head and you have to write something much more complicated. I know I will come back to that again. So, uh, so it was the simplest, simplest possible arrangement of loop nests, and it was quite complex with, with a loop depth of five, and there was no wasted memory for, for storage of temporary data. But on the downside was that this was high stride data access everywhere, and that also the that this was true for the temporary data that was needed in these routines, but also for the for the input data and for the final results, they were also accessed with high strides. Um, so what I had to tackle was these loop nests of depth five, and I had to change the order of the two or three innermost uh, innermost loops. So here's a diagram of how, how it looks like. Um, so the data was tackled in groups. The first group is here in green, and then the second group in yellow. So for the first group, the, the, an intermediate value was calculated. That's where this one is, and then applied to the result also in green. And then um, a lot of data cells in, in, a different, in a different place, so not stride one, another set of intermediate data points was calculated uh, and then applied to this result. And after all the green, after all the elements of the green group were finished, then it went on to tackle the, the yellow group. Um, so there were several problems that these intermediate values were calculated one element at a time, and that each of these calculations required a nested loop, which also had high stride access inside of it. So to calculate this element one, a nested loop with high stride memory access was used. And then many operations were repeated to calculate the next intermediate value two and then three, and then also for the next group of of calculations. Um, so the solution that we came up with was to calculate all the green elements at once, we rearranged the loop order for the inner two or three loops. We created temporary arrays to, to facilitate that, and we removed quite a lot of operations. But the most important part was that all this access to these intermediate values and also doing the calculation of these intermediate values, um, all this data access was stride one. There's still a, a remaining problem, as you can see from, from the figure. The intermediate values are now calculated in a group, but they are applied to the result, and the result is not stored in, in stride one. Um, Okay, let's go to region number two. 15% of time was spent in three routines, and each routine performed a vector-vector uh, uh, operation with, with the help of some MKL uh, libraries. And intermediate results were stored, so this is just a, um, a representation of what, what happened in the code. So you, in, in my example here, I have two input vectors, V1 and V2. 
and from that you calculate the intermediate vector one, and then there's the third vector V3, you calculate the intermediate vector two, and then from the two intermediate vectors you calculate the result. And that was all done in kind of a modular fashion, so each of these operations was done in one subroutine. The solution was then, of course, to do one routine performing all three operations, so you get the result um, from V1, V2, and V3 just by slightly changing what, what these operations did. So here this was a case where code modularity got, got in the way. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about how we got the code um, to a state where it was production-ready code. So the code setup was, in general, in, in the code, you, you have to follow four branches for two ge geometries, and then for each geometry, you have to do two very similar computations. And I tackled only one of these four, four branches, and it was an isolated change to, to, to a routine with only 500 lines, but still, it got very complicated by adding all these temporary arrays and changing all these loops. So I decided to write the co new, new code with two switches so that I could calculate the old values and the new values. But if I have all, both switches uh, active, then um, there would be an automatic comparison of all intermediate and final results in that routine. And that really worked worked out well because I was able to basically debug the, the code that I did except for one bug. Uh, I had flipped one instance of, these, of, of two variables, which I name here nx and ny, and I didn't find it because in my test setup it was degenerate, so nx was equal to ny. But when I gave the code to my, to my collaborators, they ran it on different test cases and it was immediately obvious what the problem was because they turned on both flags, calculate old, calculate new, and they found, they found the difference. So, so that was, a really, that was a, really, a strategy that really worked in this, in this case. And also, by allowing the user not to debug only this one test case, but everything that they, that they always do, um, gave them the confidence that this was really a production version a code segment that they could then easily incorporate into their into their real code. So, um, uh, yeah, here bullet number three is the group then was confident regarding the validity of the code. The build-in checking of the result worked uh, worked perfectly, and so uh, they they created then a version of the code that they could run on. On their usual, with their usual setup of thousands of cores, and they got a speed up of 1.6 and to 1.7. And in this little table, you see a breakup. So region one uh, got a speed up of 2x, uh, region two of 1.5x. These are just rough numbers, and then the rest was unchanged. So it went from a 75-15-10 split to a 60-20-20 uh, split. And now region one and also region two are now executed at a reasonable percentage of peak, which was, as far as I remember, about 15%. Okay, so there were several factors that made this project a real success. So the users were very interested and engaged, and uh, you, we all know that that was not always the case, and sometimes nothing really happens, or you do something and... Uh, it, it never goes into the production version of the code. Also, the, the code was written by the group, so they, know, they knew the in and out of the code, and it wasn't a black box to, to all of us. Uh, it was very nice that we had this boiled down experiment on one node that had uh, resulted in very fast turnaround, and also compilation was, was easy. There was a single make file, and it was easy to understand. And I'm involved in another project where it takes me already a month to, f to derive a setup that I can understand so that I can make changes together with the group that, that does that. But here it was much easier. Um, the tools also worked. We all know tools do not always work, but here Perfect Expert worked like a charm, and then it was code inspection, and then later on vectorization reports from the compiler. MPI scaling was not a problem, and also the code was in proper working order. That's also not 
something that I always uh, encounter. There were no bugs, and the code was well commented and non-spaghetti, so I could understand what, what actually was going on. And a good project, you know, ends with a good result, and the 1.7 uh, overall speed up was, was actually very good. And the other thing that I always look for that there's a, there's a publication, and in this case we have a journal paper in the making, and the latest results look, look very, very good. Okay, let's talk a little bit about remaining problems. So one of the problems is that the code actually started a little bit on the wrong foot. Now with the changes, the intermediate steps and the intermediate um, uh, data is now calculate with, calculated with stride one, but the actual data is actually still accessed with high strides. And there's no remedy except to completely rewrite the code. My estimate is that this is a full man year of doing it. So, so one experienced person for four year. I think most members agree with that, but there are other members who think, ah, oh, two weeks or something, but I don't, I, I, I don't think so. I, I don't think that, that, could, that could work. And it's not your man year. No, it would be my man year. Okay. That would, uh, so the question was whose man year it would be, and I would guess that it would take me, myself a year to write, to rewrite the At code. At full time? No. At full time? At full time. I mean, this is 50,000 lines of code, and you have to. You're assuming you want the right answer, too. <laughs> ah, yeah, the right answer. Yeah. Okay, so the, a rewritten code could be extremely fast, because the kernel of this code is basically that you do a bunch of matrix vector operations. The matrix stays constant, and you just apply different vectors. And in this case, you could just bundle the vectors into a second matrix, and then you could use a matrix matrix operation to perform these operations. The current performance is something like 15% of peak, but we all know if you do a matrix matrix with, with libraries, then you could probably go up to 70% of peak with all the support operations that, that you need. But this is certainly beyond the scope of the project and will most likely never, never be done. So, but if, if somebody at some point writes a new code that tackles a new problem but is similar to this code, then he could benefit from all the lessons learned. And here are some uh, benefits and lessons learned. So 1.7x speedup enables the group to begin tackling a much larger problem. It also um, um, allowed us to make a case to give the group uh, early access to Stampede, and that, that request was uh, uh, granted. And there's a follow-up pr proposal now uh, has been submitted, and it's going to be reviewed in two weeks, and it shows very nice uh, progress. And the group is actually now asking for the same number of SUs that they had last time, but to do twice as much, uh, twice as much work. So lessons learned are uh, all users basically have to learn that, and, and we are all basically, I think, in the process of learning that, to pay attention to detail, to consider the memory access as the most crucial, and then the second one would be then vectorization. Vectorization also works on non-stride one data, but um, it is much more effective when when you do stride one memory access. So in, in, I always consider memory access as the most cru crucial. Then you have to make sure that the code vectorizes, and then there, then there's a bunch of of other things you consider after that. Operations are mostly for free, but the combination of access operations, remember there was a frequent recalculation of some intermediate data, and high stride access is actually very, very slow. And the use of temporary arrays in our case helped um, to facilitate stride one access and uh, uh, facilitated the rearranging of the, of the nested loops. Uh, finally, Compilers can do only so much, and the compilers always do something. If you give the compiler bad code, it makes the bad code a little bit better. If you give the compiler good code, it makes the good code a lot better. But it's not that the compiler can take bad code and make it really, really good. It improves everything just a bit if it is bad code, and if you have good code, it can sometimes really do uh, a lot. And uh, one thing that I, that I tell uh, um, all users that I talk to, the initial code design steps are most important. So if you, if you make a mistake, 
on day one with your data layout, then you can never change that later. And we, we encountered that here. We alleviated the problem a lot, but there are still some remaining problems with the data access. Um, so in general, users know very little about writing good and fast code. So the, the more knowledgeable users, and, and my, my colleagues here in, in, this, in this project were, were certainly among this, this group, they know how to write good code in this sense that they have, that they make it modular and that they write it non-spaghetti and then when, in this case, in this, in this hot routine, they had a five times nested loop and they, they wrote it straight without any detours or, or complicated measures. And that's very good for all the rest of the code, but when you want to write fast code, then these fast codes have to be written differently and much more complicated. So the code that the group is now using, actually this inner routine, is much more complicated than the original code. It's also much faster though. Okay, then let's talk a little bit about the, the Xeon 5. So to use any accelerator GPU or or um, coprocessor, you have to use uh, a thread for a variety of reasons. So this code was pure MPI, so the first thing was to add OpenMP parallel regions, which I then added around regions one and two. Just to remind you, the split now is region one is 60% of the time, region two is 20%, and all the serial rest is, is also 20%. Then we compiled the code for the for native execution of on the Xeon Phi cards. So I went from nine MPI tasks on a single node to nine, to nine MPI tasks on nine different cards attached to nine different nodes. So with a code that has 20% in serial uh, sections, mm, the scaling can't be good. And of course, my scaling was only 3.5 to four for some number of threads higher than 15. 20% of the time is spent in serial code, so the maximum speed up you can get is actually five. Um, and that also meant that the absolute performance was low, so one Xeon Phi was not as fast as one Sandy Bridge core. So naturally now we have to move on to, to offloading, so we leave the serial post, the code on the host and we move the parallel region onto the Phi by means of offloading. So the initial goal that we set out a year ago before Stampede became online was actually too ambitious because the general rule applied here, optimize the code first on your host architecture and then port to the file. If you would execute the original code on the file, it would, be, it would have been extra slow because all these high stride um, memory accesses and insufficient vectorization that you get away with it on the host, but you cannot get away with it on the file. So um, another experience that we made was, again, compiling of the code was easy. We just uh, changed one compiler flag, and that was it. Um, making it work on the files is the time-consuming part. Two-thirds of the work is already done. We did the optimization. We did the OpenMP. Uh, now the remaining work is offloading and communication. So in the next proposal, we will ask for a follow-up ECSS so that we can finish this. So summary, um, the code optimized for the host uh, it gave us a 1.7 uh, uh, speed up. We created right from the beginning production grade code so we don't have to redo everything now in the production setup. We investigated the Xeon Phi. Not surprisingly, native mode was too slow and we have to go to, uh, to offload. Uh, and we learned uh, some, some valuable lessons to pay attention to data access, uh, to uh, to uh, think about vectorization or to understand what vectorization is and to look at vectorization reports, uh, not to be afraid of using temporary arrays to facilitate stride one access and vectorization and also to, to avoid recalculation of some temporary data and also to, to carefully think about the code design at the beginning. Uh, this is too late for this current project though, but may be valuable for, for the next future project. That's all I have. Thank you. Lars, thank you very much for a fascinating talk. Um, I'm hearing a little bit of echo. I have a few questions of my own, but let me open up the phone lines for others here for a moment.
Presentation mode is now disabled. Okay, questions from other folks on the webinar for Lars. There were a, a couple of things that struck me about, about the presentation. One was that uh, you know, code can be cleanly constructed. However, that's not generally the most optimal way to construct it for any given architecture. I wonder, in your experience, how, uh, how, how much you've seen code design have to change for different architectures. Like, would you have to go through a complete loop restructuring for you know, the next architecture, and would it, you know, kind of... No, uh, I, I don't think it's related to the architecture. Every architect... I mean, there are not that many architectures around now, but so if we just talk about x86, then um, your optimize, uh, optimal code looks much more convoluted than, than the clean code that you would write if you would follow the guidelines from the programming book. So the, the two things that you have to keep in mind is that modularity is nice, but if, you, if, if you're really in the hot parts of your code, you better bunch everything together so that you don't have to repeat all your memory access. And then uh, you, you, you have to write your loops that they can vectorize. And, um, and, and both of these um, tricks or, or things, they work well on all architectures. So if you would convert your code to CUDA to, write, to run it on the GPU, you would basically do the same thing. Okay, yeah, that's, uh, yeah that, that helps. So it would look equally convoluted, you're saying, regardless. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I liked very much the way you programmed in the comparisons of the two methods, uh, especially for verification. I think that's often a problem in ECSS projects, we've done all this work, the code goes a lot faster, but are the results the same as someone in the audience attack um, mentioned? So having that comparison built in, I think, is yeah. really, really smart. Um, um, you also mentioned unoptimized code being even slower on the FI. Uh, so are, are you folks seeing users who come with their same code that ran elsewhere, and it's going slower unless they invest some time in optimization? Yeah, so the, if, if you have really code that doesn't vectorize and has tight stride memory access, then the penalty you pay on the Xeon Phi is much higher than the penalty you see on the, on the, on the normal Xeon, on the Sandy Bridge and Stampede. So with these initial steps of, vector, of, of optimization, the return on investment is higher on the Phi than on the, on the Sandy Bridge. I got it. Thanks, Thanks very much. Um, I see that Sergio had posted a chat message about the extreme scaling workshop coming up later in August, and how this would be, um, you know, quite a relevant project for that. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Um, do you want to say just just a word or two, uh, Sergio, and then I want to get to a question from Lester. Well, I just, uh, you know, I would just say that uh, the deadline now is uh, May twenty fourth. Uh, I don't know if we're going to extend it again. I don't know what exactly, but but I think on Lars and and Klaus, I mean, it, it sounds like just what you said just now would make an excellent abstract, and uh, um, it would be great if you were to consider uh, submitting it. And I would also say anybody else on the uh, call should maybe go to the call for uh, presentations and read it. And if you've done any work. Uh, at all, I would say, and gotten managed to get any experience with, uh, especially with accelerators, uh, Phi or Kepler, then uh, we would really uh, urge you to submit uh, uh, to 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 this uh, to this conference, and in any case, to maybe uh, uh, plan on part on coming to Boulder and participating. Yes, Sergio, we we will look into that and and keep you posted. Uh, thank you. Just. You know, send in the submission. <laughs> uh, thanks, Sergio. There was a good question from uh, Lester Ingber, who asks if there were any science compromises that had to be made in this type of optimization. Did you have to sacrifice any generalization to other problems? I think since we have the science PIs on the, the call uh, also, um, they might be able to answer that. 
No, I, I, I don't think so, because all the changes were, were local, and the, the data that we calculated was exactly the same as the original data, m minus rounding errors and, and, uh, or differences and, and things like that. So, um, um, so I do not think that we changed anything in how the code behaved in general. Okay, thank you very much, Lar. 